Welcome to Active, Active Office, Office, a podcast that covers the everyday activity that adds years to your life and life to your years. With Lawrence Smith, father, husband, and footballer turned entrepreneur from Smart Break, and Oli Tikkanen, researcher, all sport enthusiast turned entrepreneur from Fibion. Get ready for your dose of discussions on physical activity, exercise, working life, and rabbit holes that lead nowhere. And here are your hosts, Lawrence and Oli. Welcome. This is Active Office with Oli and Lawrence, and today we have Richard Tathpin. Did I say it right? That sounds great. Ah, perfect. It's, I knew. It's, see, it's, it's more like Tathpin, I would that, say. That, it was good enough. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, and of course, they are not in Kokola with me. They are in Liverpool, which I often call Liverpool because I'm a Manchester guy. Um, right. Yeah. But yeah. Setting the stage right there. Yeah, Welcome. setting the stage. And, and actually, I, I hope you know the the most popular album ever was recorded in Liverpool. So I hope this podcast will be the most popular <laughs> podcast ever. Recorded, Let's see. In, Let's recorded see. in Liverpool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so welcome, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Richard, would you like to tell a little bit about your background, how how you have come to this point with your studies and, and what do you do in Liverpool? So, um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. Our um, pleasure, yeah. So, uh, my background, uh, I I come from Finland. I was I was born in Sweden and I moved to Finland when I was about five years old. Yeah. And my father is from Finland, and my mother is Icelandic, so oh, wow. it's a quite quite Scandinavian mix, I would say. Yeah. Nice. Um, Full so breed. I, I lived my first good twenty years in the United uh, in the, in Finland, one year in the United States, and then after that I moved to Sweden to pursue my studies right. in coaching and sport management. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, and then during that time, so my background in sports is in ice hockey. So once I stopped doing that, I, uh, I became a coach doing my studies in, ice, uh, in Sweden. And um, I kind of pursued that career for a few years as an ice hockey coach. Yeah, interesting. that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, that actually brought me to Iceland where I met my wife. And so... As things usually happen when you meet a beautiful wife, a woman, you kind of go after you know them and stay where they are. So I ended up staying in Iceland. Absolutely. And, um, the, the, the ice hockey scene in in, in uh, Iceland is not very big. It's only three teams. So I didn't really see myself pursuing a, or continuing being an ice hockey coach there yeah. for for the rest of my life. So. I again went back to school and, okay. um, and pursued a career as a psychologist, which then brought me to Liverpool uh, okay. to do my PhD. So that's the story. That that's is the uh, story. one. That's a heck of a story. <laughs> yeah. So you've been in places. Yeah. Where Where in the US did you live? So I lived in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. I was 17 years old when I moved there. Okay. Uh, as an exchange student and and, uh, and also to play ice hockey. So. Okay. Very yeah. right, interesting. That's good. Yeah. And so, what do you do now in Liverpool? What's what's the thing here? So here in Liverpool, I, I got a uh, scholarship to do a research for three years, and my interest area is obviously I'm a, a clinically trained psychologist, but I also have that coaching background. So my interest is on. Uh, on mental health in athletes, especially depression, and okay. uh, so I got a scholarship to come here and uh, do a research on that. So that's that's what I'm doing. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How, nice. how 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 is the depression like among athletes? Is it more common or less common than in the normal population? Like, well, that's that's a very uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we don't really know. Um, I guess it depends a little bit what type of athletes you're looking at. Yeah. Um, research is just kind of getting started on that area uh, there's been quite a lot of research in the past couple of years but before that it's kind of been uh, it's not, it hasn't been there so okay um, but the what we know now at, at this point it, it looks like uh, athletes aren't that different from the general population there just might be different 
kind of stressors and different uh, triggers and, <coughs> and, and kind of the themes around depression or mental health can relate quite often to the life of being an athlete. So. Mm. I, I can imagine that it's different to be in, the, in playing Manchester United and your work is that than actually like <laughs> doing the excel in the office well yeah, I, yeah. See <laughs> I kind of end up being on the kind of like the uh, outsider position here because me and my son we are evertonians so uh, uh, all, right. Uh, all right well all right you, you you've gone a, up a notch for sure well definitely from last year yes yeah, yeah. so uh but uh, I, don't, i think the christmas vacation didn't do very good for the No. For the team, it looks no. like it's going the wrong way, but hopefully they're turning it around. I'm sure they will. Yeah, and so so what? Talking what, about going up and down, United has had their. Yeah, ups we won't and talk downs. about that today. I think today <laughs> we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I wanted to ask you about your PhD. So what is the more exact theme of it? What what what, what kind of things you are looking at? So there's quite a lot of things I'm or I would say we are looking at, because I'm doing this in collaboration with Reykjavik University yeah. okay. in Iceland, uh, where I did my undergrad and my master's in, in, in psychology. And I have a very good contact network there. And uh, I was lucky enough to uh, kind of hitchhike with a project already going there. So uh, we're doing a lot. So it's, it's a questionnaire based study uh, mainly. Uh, so there's a lot of questions in there. So we're looking kind of trying to map all kinds of things. All right. Okay. Um, so what we're doing, we're looking at uh, all kinds of sports specific questions about, you know, what sport they do, uh, uh, what, at what level. Well, actually, the, all, all of the participants are from uh, the national team programs. All right. Okay. So it's, it's the, uh, kind of the highest level. In, okay, the highest level, in, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we're mapping a lot of different kinds of variables, and then uh, we are looking at kind of how the mental health and the sport-specific kind of like mental skills, how do they relate to each other? So, for example, let's say uh, with in sports psychology, there's a lot of talk about like mental toughness. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of looking at that, for example, how that relates then to. Uh, the mental health aspects so is there is it a good thing you know does it also protect from mental health issues or is it uh, maybe it's a double-edged sword where yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it might be good for sports but not so good for mental health so those are kind of the things that we are yeah. looking at and we're doing it longitudinally so we're looking at over time so we're yeah. trying to look kind of uh, what predicts uh, for example my interest is on rumination like you mentioned earlier yeah yeah Uh, so rumination is about uh, shortly it's just people getting stuck in their own negative thoughts and and and, and thoughts about their depressive symptoms you know and yeah, why yeah. why me kind of questions and, and and instead of finding kind of active ways of dealing with it yeah uh, with the depression so i'm really interested in looking at that how that if you're high on that kind of tendency of getting stuck and kind of withdraw from people into your own mind how that predicts depression over time are you more likely to become depressed especially um, in times when you may not may not feel so good hmm. yeah so so w would you say that not doing rumination is kind of mental skill of coping or i don't know much about rumination so how well i, I think we all ruminate well yeah. we all do so mm. we just do it and it's like everything with when it comes to mental health or or ill health that uh We all uh, experience those things, but it's just to different degrees, maybe. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 how we deal with those things also vary between us. So I think rumination. So this, what I'm looking at, I'm I'm defining it as depressive rumination. Right. So that means that uh, in times when you feel low, how yeah. do you react to that? How do you respond to that? low mood now obviously we all feel low at sometimes uh, not least athletes who mm. you know experience highs and lows on a daily basis yeah so how do you respond to that so if you might kind of uh, decide to go to the movies and do something fun and just kind of distract your mind yeah. go for a run or whatever so that's what we see as a kind of kind of 
uh, a beneficial way of responding to a low mood. Mm. Yeah, and I'm and sure many people have different ways of coping with. Yes. Like, do they, is there like a certain guideline that you would follow, like like if like a set? Hey, here's this first set five that you should consider, or sort three suggestions to try first. I, I, I can hear that that's the American way, like, yeah, you yeah, write a course. book, like, yeah. three ways to get out yeah. of depression. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess the first step is just to uh, be aware of yourself and know yourself. Yeah. I think that uh, doing that exploration, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you know who you are and how you respond to situations and, and uh, you know, whether it's good or bad, I think the first step is to kind of know yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, then you might be able to kind of predict and, and understand the situations where you might not be dealing that great, where you might have before had some trouble, you know. Mm. Um, mm. For like for an athlete, it might be that it's those failure situations. Yeah. Like life goes really well otherwise, you know, it's you have a good family, you have wife, kids, whatever. Uh, but you're just really struggling with situations where you're losing or, or you make a mistake. So yeah. like, I think like for athletes or other high performing individuals, there's a lot of focus on yourself. Yeah. You know, um, I need to be 100%, I need to do this, I need to kind of uh, stand up and you know provide for the team or the company or whatever I work for. Yeah. And uh, so that might be one thing. So mm -hmm. once you kind of, map yourself and understand yourself your strengths and and maybe those things that you have to work on um, that might help you to kind of take the first step mm, yeah. yeah that was only one thing yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and i find it interesting like when you said that you need to know yourself like sometimes yeah. i feel kind of some anxiety or something and i start to reflect on it mm -hmm. and it might be actually because i have quite a bit of allergies it might be that actually my nose is blocked and I'm, my breathing is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And probably my brain is thinking that, oh, it's anxiety. And when yeah. I actually reflect on it, I think it's, it's actually some physical things that make me think that I have something. But I don't know, mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard other people of talking this, but I have reflected it quite a bit and often it's... It's actually quite common, like, uh, because obviously there are physical symptoms that come uh, with anxiety, such as increased breathing and heart rate and sweating and, and mm. all these kind of symptoms. Those are the same that you feel when you go to the gym or mm. when yeah. you have trouble breathing or you are uh, having allergies. Mm. Uh, so those are the same, similar as when you are you know, anxious. Yeah. So if you feel those symptoms, then your brain or I don't really like saying yeah, that. Well, Your yeah, brain tells you I don't really or, like that, but or you kind of feel that that same symptoms, and then that might trigger an anxious kind of response to it. Yeah, yeah. but I would and, never feel anxious when I'm out of breath because exercising. So yeah. I think that's that's a different feeling. Anxiety, the me. unwanted yeah. workout. Yeah, <laughs> 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 unwanted yeah. workout. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting though. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's uh, there's so many dimensions to uh, to what we've been talking about. So uh, yeah, I kind of lost that. I kind of lost now. That. Yeah, I, I also don't remember <laughs> what like, we were what? talking like. Yeah, it's it's like a mental mental breakdown. Yeah. yeah so we started from from rumination and the wrong ways of thinking. Yeah. And, and when do you think it's a problem? Like you said that your study is when it cause, causes depression. How, how, where, is the, where is the line in your opinion? Yeah, that's always an interesting thing. Where, where does it, where does the kind of negative and the positive end or start? But it's very easy on quantitative research methods. You just put a cutoff mm -hmm. score and then you look at that. But in real life, I think it's it's much more complicated. I think if you look at it, when you stop doing things that you want to do, mm. when you're not functioning the way you want to function, I think that's when you have a problem. When it affects you and your pe the people around you, yeah. then it might be a problem. But I mean, you know, some people might ruminate a lot and you look, might, might look like 
you're really vulnerable to depression mm. on paper. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. But yeah. in, in general, I think that if you have that tendency, you are a lot more likely to uh, experience at least more severe symptoms of the depression right. or depressed mood. Yeah. yeah. Um, depending on the context uh, yeah. around you. And and this is about the podcast is more about kind of office. We have been talking about athletes. So how do you see rumination in in office workers or, or knowledge workers? Mm-hmm. Well, well, like I said before, we all ruminate. But yeah. I think maybe I w- from a, like a work perspective, I would maybe look at it similar to maybe a, a, the athletic context because it is a work or a performance environment. Um, I would maybe look at the culture, you know, or the or the climate at the workplace. You know, are you is it a is a place where you can discuss things? Can mm. you be critical yeah. uh, about things without being afraid that uh, shit is gonna hit the fan, yeah. so to say? Yeah. Uh, I think that when you're allowed to be in that kind of environment, uh, whether it's your boss or coworkers, where you can actually share share your ideas. Um, critically challenge others Mm. I think that you're more likely to discuss things in the open instead of withdrawing and ruminating about it in your own head yeah yeah that's how I would see it in a workplace context and I guess for different like companies like if if, I mean I'm just trying to include like where I'm working now we have a lot of uh, I don't want to say too many uh, generalizing things towards others, but maybe some introverts that don't mm-hmm. normally talk to other people, and then it, you don't really know too much. But I don't know. I think for in a case of like going to like a marketing company, people mm-hmm. are very open. They talk a lot. They converse with others. I mean, I think then it's a little bit easier to figure out. You know, maybe the person that's normally happy comes in chit chat and. Yeah, they're not doing it quite a lot today. What's going on with them? And mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Lawrence, do you do you find it different being in a football team and and being in a, a workplace, work, workplace oh, yeah. in a in an IT company? Well, <laughs> at first, I thought, okay, this is going to be a little bit different because the locker room is, you know, you walk in, you still say hello to everybody. You ask, you know, there's the usual, hey, how was everything? You know, how's the family? if there are but most of the time it's you know just talking about the day before or the game that was on but at work it's kind of similar but there are some times where I've used my my football brain <laughs> in the workplace yeah, like, United Manchester United brain yeah maybe okay I, I would like to say like the Roy Keane way maybe where oh, okay. I like, that sounds better. like hey we have to solve this problem and I'm like well why don't we just get it out in the open and let's yeah. you attack it head on when you know maybe you confront somebody at work that's not used to that and instead of like trying to figure out the problem other ways I just went for the straight like well we're gonna get to the bottom of it the best way possible talk to the source and then that didn't go out so well <laughs> but in the locker room it's like hey you know hey uh, this guy you know made a bad cross or something you don't just say, okay, what led to the bad? No, you just say, hey, uh, what was your idea of playing it here? You know, mm-hmm. and, and in the locker room, they could say, oh, well, I was thinking of this way. But here, I've noticed in the workplace, it's kind of, I don't know, maybe it's r- not rude, but it's not normal. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's that's actually really interesting. I, I think yeah. it's also also because when you're in a team sport, you know the other players really well. You have spent so yeah. much time together. And although you spend time in the workplace, but you don't spend as much time talking and actually playing or being even physical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I think the thing is probably that in the sports team you can actually, because you know people better, you yeah. can say things more straight on when you know that this guy can take it. Oh. Yeah, and I try to tell like some of the the younger guys like, be a, be a sponge in the, on the team like. I know exactly what, you know, the player to my right, my left. I know how exactly they pass the ball. Mm-hmm. I know how, you know, when they get nervous about passing a ball. I know when they get nervous about trying to head a ball. I know when they 
could, can I can see it before it's happening. Like, okay, they don't want to chase this guy because they think that they're not fast enough. So they're going to take an extra five meters back. Then I know, okay, I need to be <laughs> moving now. Mm. I know that's going to happen. But in, in mm-hmm. the workplace, you know, I'm in my office. I don't know what, you know, what the others are doing all day. I don't. I mean, I just know what me and, you know, the person I work with closely, which is right across from me, I know, I know what we want to do on a daily basis. I know what she'll do. I know her process. She knows mine. So, but outside of my little area you know it's like we're in our own little bubble mm-hmm. but still try to be social um, which is tough to do and it's not the best way is not to do the football way <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no I mean you would look at look at the context as we sometimes talked about this how how crazy is that it, it actually is within this in, in the sports uh, I mean if you would like translate all the kind of Uh, coach player discussions and 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 how they interact into a normal workplace yeah i mean you would get probably fired the first day I mean, <laughs> yeah i, I mean probably yeah. the way you know for example coaches you know just it just kind of you just are built into that through the culture how you talk to your players especially yeah. in times of failure you know or yeah, how yeah. players behave towards each yeah. other Yeah. You know, so, and I'm maybe looking at it from a kind of more the masculine uh, sport culture. Yeah. 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 So, so what do you think? What are the good skills or characteristics that you can actually learn from the sport that you could bring in the in the work life? I think uh, it's kind of cliche, but you know, teamwork. Yeah. Teamwork. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think. Well, if I would take, for example, one one example, I just read an article here uh, a while back, and it was talking discussing athlete mental health issues. Yeah. And they were discussing that you know, athletes are this type of p- group of people that are highly perf- perfectionist, uh, goal driven, uh, highly self centered in pursuing those goals. Yeah. Um, And that might be a reason that they might experience mental health issues. Mm. However, once they do then finally realize that they have a problem, whatever it is, and they get some help realizing it, they use those same skills to actually get out of the, that negative okay. place. Mm. Because they are good to work with. As a psychologist, once you get an athlete on your side working on some problem, mm. they will go 100% and mm. do it. And you can really see some, you know, results. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that athletes bring with them or someone who has been in the athlete environment is that when you put a task on the table for them to finish, mm-hmm. I think you, well, if the person likes what he's doing at the workplace, yeah, he will probably deliver a pretty good work ethic and good results yeah. yeah so do you think it's about kind of goal setting and then determination to reach those goals so how would you put it in words like yeah uh, well when i was playing i don't think i ever ever put any clear goals for myself it was just kind of innate drive to be the best i could be and mm. um, mm. that's so goal. i'm not yeah. there's yeah. probably a lot of more people that know more about goal setting and how that uh, mm. But uh, I would say that. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> so many idea yeah. thoughts going yeah. through my head. No, I, I think it was just about the goal setting and and, yeah. and and determination to go towards those goals that actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think I think it's about just how we are raised up by the sports parents, yeah. so to say, the culture mm. uh, to. Especially, you know, well, I wouldn't say team sports, also individual sports, but it's maybe a little bit different. But that you are supposed to do your best because if you don't, the whole team suffers. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of that kind of thinking that you have to pull your weight hmm. if you're gonna yeah. be part of this. So such a teamwork. Right? Yeah, and 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 that kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, effort and. Mm being there doing your job um, 
I think those are the kind of the values or, or attitudes that we get through mm. sport. Yeah. And, and it, I think those who don't really do that, they kind of move to other areas yeah. uh, from sports quite quickly. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, go on. Yeah, because I, I grew up like, uh, you know, my, my father always said, you're going to play every sport. I'm going to mm-hmm. put you in everything. And then it's up to you to decide what you want to do. He's, yeah. he's not going to say, you're going to do this and you're going to keep playing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I remember I tried basketball. He put me at basketball once. And yeah, I was loved shooting hoops in the driveway. Could do it all day. Yeah. But then when I got on the court, I was like, man, I really hate basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he clearly, he said, I could see it day and night. I, hate, I hated sitting on the bench. But mm-hmm. in my head, I knew I shouldn't be playing. Because I was not as good. I should have been on the bench. But I hated it. And I just knew that, okay, this isn't me. But he was also, you know, if, if I had a game that, you know, I didn't play very good or if I didn't play that much, he wouldn't say, oh, well, you're better than them. You know, it'll come. Mm-hmm. He didn't say that. He was, well, you're not good enough. You're you're on the bench. You're not training like they are. You're not, um, you know, on the weekends, maybe they go and do an extra workout. You're, you're not doing that. You're going with your friends and partying or playing. He was very honest with that, but he was also like, you know, if you want to do that, I'll give you every chance you can to succeed. I'll, you know, we'll, you know, I'll drive you to the fields if you want to do extra stuff. Like that's, mm-hmm. And I think in my head, uh, it just made me want to, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And I did it. So I made sure that in the trainings, I was always better than the person next to me, but in a way that I'm trying to show them that they need to do extra. Um, so he can. He, it, it sounds like he created a pretty good environment where you could could explore, but at the same time you, it was uh, self explorative as well. You know, in a, in a way that you found that you were allowed to actually find what you actually like and what you want to do. Yeah, and, and it was nice because I I remember specifically one time coming home and uh, I had played. It was like the first time we had this like you have to try out for this team. And I made the I made the team, and it was like 200 kids tried out from the city, and I made the team. I made the 18. I was like, yes. And I started training a little bit more, but not as much. I was, you know, doing other sports and doing other things, going out for fun movies or whatever. And I was on the bench all the time. And I thought I'm, and I remember telling my dad like this coach, this that, and I was kind of I had a little sass in the car after one of the tournaments and. <laughs> I just said, yeah, this, this coach is an idiot. And, you know, I'm better than this player. And I, I was, I mean, I didn't let anything, I didn't hold back anything. And I remember he stopped the car and was like, uh, first of all, uh, that coach, get, you know, he picked you. He chose you. And you, this weekend, instead of doing, and he, I remember uh, this the, the instance because I was mm-hmm. going to go kick with the other guys on the team. And like, do a little bit of training, more fun. That was all, you know, when you're younger, it's always fun. You know, how many shoot, you know, goals can I score? And, um, and I didn't do that. I <laughs> did something else. And he goes, you know, you're choosing to do this. So don't sit here and sass hit like, you know, <laughs> talk about him. And I just sat there and I was like, well, and I remember the first thought was, well, my dad doesn't understand. <laughs> he's not on my side. But as I got older, I was like, okay, he's, you know, he's making me not blame others as much you know of course you want to always like ah the coach you know Mm -hmm. but at the same time it's you know that's also he made me think like what could I have done better and I don't think he meant to yeah so you think this kind of very honest approach and straightforward approach from your father was good yeah yeah I thought it was great I thought it was great. Um, and of course, but he was like, he was my coach growing up and there were always some funny stories with him. <laughs> Not playing some of the players, uh, listening to the parents complain and, you know, my kid needs to play. And he's like, well, your kid has been playing the butterfly game for 25 minutes or playing like that he's a dinosaur. Yeah. So maybe your kid shouldn't be playing sports. You know, he was very honest with that. Um, but it was... Yeah, he was very open, which helped me out a lot uh, in a sense that it, it 
brought this I want to win but I want to like <laughs> if yeah. I was playing one on one basketball in my driveway I knew yeah. every inch of my driveway so, so, I knew where I'm going to yeah so I, where I, I think this I'm going to be maybe a little bit relates to my mental driveway. toughness and I wanted to come re- <laughs> and I Richard like mentioned it in the beginning the mental toughness and we are in UK and it's they always talk about it in in relation to sport about yeah. mental toughness and and so on so what is it richard and, and yeah what is mental toughness <laughs> well that's a it's a very good question i think yeah i would put it like this mental toughness is a word that's used to introduce the word resilience to sports people so in my in in my view how i see mental toughness is basically pretty much just resilience being resilient in tough situations um, being able to bounce back from uh, a bad situation um, and uh, yeah that's that's very simply put it but that's how I kind of view so so could you give just an easy example how, how would it work what is resilience in in sport or work context could you give it? yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously, mental toughness is not one of my. I'm not a. In layman's terms. Like a, it's <laughs> not my speciality in that way. But obviously, it's just. Um, let's say yeah, yeah. Um, at workplace or, uh, or in sports, elite sports, you are, obviously, going to experience mm. some kind of setbacks. Mm. Now, if you're mentally tough, you'll find a way or. Uh, you'll see those situations as challenges and you uh, or even if you wouldn't at the moment see it as a challenge to overcome you would just probably just find a way to deal with it hmm. yeah. uh, so the more mentally tough you are the more better you are to come out as victorious from situations like this whereas if you're not as mentally tough I, don't really like the word mentally tough. I'd, ra- I'd rather use the word resilience. resilience. Yeah, yeah. Because mental it. toughness, it it makes you. Uh, it makes sound like it's yeah. double-edged sword. Okay. Yeah. Like and that I- you're mentally tough. You know, you're gritty. You go through stuff, and. Um, yeah. If you're not mentally tough, then you're weak. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, so. I, I, yeah i would like to say that in sport context i think it's often that if you have an injury you kind of play with it yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. which is usually just stupid yeah you just just rest and then you can play actually yeah. well if you, if you play with the bad injury yeah. that might be it so it's it's a yeah. stupidity yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't call that mental toughness yeah. uh well in in to agree though uh yeah. i mean i've many times <laughs> during my hockey career got a slap shot on on my hand or my leg or whatever mm. and it hurts like hell and you might not be walking really well the day after but you still finish mm. the game mm. I mean that's I would see that yeah. not only as mental toughness but also physical toughness mm. uh, but yeah. as long as you know that it's not a serious injury it's just yeah it's just painful it's pain yeah more more like a pain. i mean yeah. Yeah. i think that's kind of the way people see mental toughness uh, without uh, mm. any reservation they're just like yeah that's mental toughness you know mm. you just gotta push through you got a slap shot on your face and miss eight teeth you know you're bleeding everywhere you're puking a little bit but you still go back on and play mm. yeah yeah i mean yeah 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 i can understand that but if you get a concussion Mm-hmm. You get knocked out, which happened to me a couple of times, and I I I con- I finished yeah. the game. I didn't remember anything of the game. That was stupid. Yeah. But then again, I didn't. As an athlete, I didn't know better. Yeah. yeah. And coaches didn't ask me. So if you would call that mental toughness, mm-hmm. uh, then obviously mental toughness is not a very good thing to have. Yeah. In situations like that, because yeah. Yeah, that might yeah. end your career tomorrow, or whatever. So yeah. that's why I like to. Call, re- call it resilience to kind of get it, get through and mm. get on with things af- even if you've had a, a bad situation or failure you just kind of you know hey uh, you know I'll, I'll just keep on working I need to get better at this you kind of assess you know so you find it, it's, it's it's more like an active approach to sit problems mm. instead of kind of like a 
Okay. Passive. Now I'm kind of getting a little bit into the rumination as well because those with you know ruminated tendencies yeah. used to usually think that they're thinking about solving a problem, mm -hmm. but they actually kind of just mm -hmm. think about it. They become quite passive. They uh, All right. withdraw. Yeah. Yeah. But then if you have that more active approach, you that kind of mental toughness. You kind of like find a solution. You just kind of push through things and 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 try yeah. to make things as good as possible. So, yeah. 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 All right. So I I have a question. You said that if you have setbacks, you go through them. So for example, if we would think that there's a startup company and they would mm -hmm. be three first years, they have absolutely no revenue. <laughs> would you call that, you still keep going on, do you call that <laughs> mental no toughness, resilience. <laughs> resilience, or just stupid? <laughs> what would you say? Just on a hypothetical level. Or a hobby, level. or it could be a hobby. <laughs> on a very, very hypothetical <laughs> level? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I would call it... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit stupid. Well, uh, f at least not very profitable, as it, as you mentioned, no yeah, revenue. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, if you, I think mm. it's just very good if you still, after three years, are able to do it, which I don't think many people would. Yeah. So now it's actually four uh, years. Actually in one other example, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, obviously, it, it, it <laughs> I would see that as you know, mental toughness. Uh, you know, you keep on going, you keep on trying, you you believe in what you're doing, so um, probably hasn't been always easy, so... Mm, yeah, no, it's... it's yeah. Mental yeah, something. Mental something, something, yeah. Yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, so we've been going through the mental toughness, uh, rumination. Richard, you've been doing also something about the craftsmanship. Could you give a short introduction What what is craftsmanship? Mm. I'm like being yeah. tested here. <laughs> you, you, you're the yeah, professional yeah. of Welcome to the among podcast. three of us about <laughs> craftsmanship. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, craftsmanship uh, within the context of sports—that's what I've been introduced to a couple of years back by a person uh, called Vidar Halterson. He's an Icelandic uh, uh, sociologist that does research on, among others, uh, athletes and why are some athletes become better than others and, mm -hmm. and, and how the culture and the, the the context influences that. So he's obviously a sociologist, not a psychologist. So I'm looking at the person and he's looking at the bigger context. Of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think our ideas were similar and he introduced me to this work that he was doing. So he, he he's bringing from literature uh, about craftsmanship, like the kind of workshop back in the days when people were um, learning some specific skill, you know, from the sword maker to the fisherman to the, uh, what is it called, Buseppa. carpenter. Carpenter, yeah. yeah. Uh, how they, you know, master a skill, how they, how they create a skill, how they, okay. uh, how the knowledge goes from one generation to the next kind of, uh, the master and apprentice kind of relationship. Mm. So he was looking at that in the context of sports, and a lot, a lot of the things that he's uh, that comes up within the craftsmanship contest is that kind of you know focus on the task at hand, uh, the the intrinsic mm. kind of motivation just to do the task for. Mm. For it, for the pleasure of itself of just doing it, mm -hmm. so um, and kind of you know, for a lot of focus on the skill, you know, mastering a skill, but also seeing it almost as a play or fun or you know just enjoyment. So what they've been doing, they were looking at you know um, athletes and in education as well. You know, mm -hmm. how you approach a task at hand. Okay. Do you take it like, oh, I have to finish this freaking thing yeah. and, you know, uh, can I just, you know, get it done with? Or are you that person that kind of like, oh, you know, I want to learn more about this and all the little parts that function and how does this, the whole actually come together from its parts? You know, that kind of explorative, you know, that interest in, you know, yeah. knowing everything about the task at hand. So Obviously that's not what happens at the workplace when your boss throws you a bunch of paperwork to finish and that's gonna be like wow 
but in general your your approach yeah, to the yeah. things that you enjoy to do how do you approach them so. but but could it be like the goal orientation yeah. that if you just think that all right i need to get this done in one week mm -hmm. that's kind of goal oriented but if you more task oriented you you want to do it well you want to learn mm -hmm. while doing it yeah i mean I th that's part of it it's not it's not the same as that but it it is part of it mm. um and that's what they've been looking at and it's it's kind of just kind of kicking off now there um you know whether athletes kind of because they come from this skill mastery skill environment which they've been involved in all their life mm. since mm. they were maybe five four years old and they learn through play you know mm. a lot of learning comes through playing um, do they you know come into a workplace or education with different set of skills like the way they approach things and that was a little bit what we talked about earlier about um, kind of the effort we put into things uh, we um, I don't know, mean like athletes mm. Uh, yeah. kind of common uh, quality that uh, you approach things from a you know I want to do this as well as I can uh, with the full effort uh, that kind of engagement mm. yeah so they've been looking at this whether athletes differ in craftsmanship from those who are not athletes and it seems like there seems to be like a especially higher level athletes so higher craftsmanship approach than lower level or non-athletes um, so that's that's very interesting mm. so that's what I and we are actually looking at now here in Liverpool a little bit mm. uh, whether that kind of transfers to another population yeah yeah well uh, obviously in Iceland it's been uh, he's looking also because that research group that they are doing in Iceland they they started by just doing qualitative studies and they research sort of fishermen, you know, how do yeah. how do they create that or or master that skill, you know, uh, father to son or you know at the you know you get to a boat and you work under the captain and you just kind of learn, you know, the rules, the values, yeah. the skills at that place. So that's how where it started and what um, what in in sports obviously Iceland is a small island behind mm. you know god's back somewhere there you know <laughs> up behind, in the north behind, yeah yeah um, so and and the environment is tough and you know it's few people and you know so they were re really interested in looking at the kind of why did the football team of iceland the national team do so well mm. how did yeah. they manage to first get to the european championship and then to the world championship um, mm. And that's what they kind of, he, he actually wrote a book about it, you know, how small nations uh, achieve international success. Uh, success. Yeah. And that's a little bit that learning to play, you know, the national team players of Iceland maybe came to play for the country. They came to meet their pals, their lads, and, you know, it's yeah. fun, you know. But maybe bigger countries like Argentina, you have those or Spain, whatever, you have those big stars coming in, they maybe don't really want to do it. Um, mm, yeah. I don't yeah. know, but yeah. it was some kind of that kind of that the learning is to f true fun, it's to mm. play. It's, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the trying to, the, you know, then look into other areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think you said about kind of the old way of working, either the carpenter or the mm -hmm. sword maker. And, and then sports, they're still quite the same. You need to perfect the skill. But if you actually think the, the modern work for most people, it's so specialized. Mm -hmm. You know, some doctor is specialized for the nose mm -hmm. and maybe some functions of the nose. Yeah. And, and in the an office, there's somebody who's editing the audio of a podcast. There's other yeah. people talking <laughs> it and the other person is making the video there. And, yeah. and so it's, it's really, an, and maybe you don't get the holistic view of what you're doing like even even when I was doing research it's like you researching such a small part mm -hmm. and then somebody else is bringing that to to disseminating the knowledge to people and then somebody else is planning the actions how and then there's politicians trying to influence how people like creating incentives for people and but I'm just studying this really really small thing and it, it might be kind of 
frustrating. I, I think the, the, the modern her. work is, is yeah. maybe not very good for this. Well, I, I would see it, I agree to some degree on that, but also it depends a little bit in what context you're working. So if you're working, for example, in a, in a bigger collaborative group that where everybody have their roles, but then you also have that whole together, like almost like mm. we've been doing in the research, yeah. that we kind of come from different fields and we maybe know a little bit this area better than all the other ones, but we still have a kind of common theme or a common goal that uh, that unite us. So mm. let's say you have that that guy working on that nose only plastic surgeon. <laughs> But he might be working with a bunch of other people that specialize in different areas, but they're still working to maybe make that person be whole again physically after mm. a big injury or whatever. Yeah. And so that's the whole, but then you have those parts, moving parts in it. So if that's the context, I think it's I think it's great that you can specialize in something that you have passion for and just like that but yeah yeah if you if you understand what i mean so if if you yeah but yeah i don't know yeah but actually now as i'm thinking of it that's probably why i i really enjoy working in a startup because you are mm -hmm. you see the whole you're trying yeah. to get the whole thing you're creating kind of an entity in its itself and you're bringing <laughs> all the things you are you are doing doing the white papers, you are doing the podcast, yeah. you are doing marketing, you are doing sales, you are doing accounting. So you actually mm -hmm. all the time have the view of the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of yeah. when you're doing research, you are researching one small part within a cell in some small <laughs> population, which is, which is super tiny. And I, I think yeah. for me, at least, it's about the holistic and, and kind of having the bigger picture mm -hmm. what you're doing. I, and I haven't thought this before and it's actually nice that now I understand what yeah. might might make me actually happy while while working. Yeah, I, I guess it's also exciting because you don't even know what will work. You know what you'll be good at doing if when you do everything like that when you have that startup. Yeah, you know, yeah. We, you, when we had this idea of the podcast, you were like, I don't. I mean, my thought was, can we do this? We're yeah. gonna do it. We we do we, we don't know even yet can we do yeah, it but yeah. at least we have a nice microphone stand it looks professional even yeah, though it's but not we're the doing most expensive it and we're gonna yeah. try you know we're gonna try to grow it this way and we're gonna try to grow it this way and I think that's the exciting part too with like startup time. yeah yeah but you have to try everything really and see what sticks almost yeah and actually as we're recording we didn't know that this becomes so popular as as it is when this comes out <laughs> so people who are listening like the, what they're talking about yeah it's pre-recorded we didn't know the popularity yeah, yeah. before yeah. of course but yeah. yeah it's it's i think it's um uh, once you like we talked very early in this amazing podcast yeah uh, <laughs> you know, once you kind of figure out who you are yourself, I think everybody needs to do that because then it's going to be so much easier to figure out what you want to do with your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you just kind of go from one thing to another without ever sitting down and reflecting. Now we're talking about other part of rumination, which is kind of reflecting thing on things, um, which is more of a active way of figuring out things. Um, so by doing that then you kind of also know what you want to do you Oli for example mm -hmm. you uh, you're doing a lot of different kind of things and that's probably the person you are I mean, yeah, I, 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 like, I could agree on that yeah but then another person actually likes looking at that little cell in his office somewhere on the 18th floor mm -hmm. by himself or herself so once you kind of figure out what you want to do, what, you know mm. who you are, you're aware of your strengths, your weaknesses, and if you're that kind of person that kind of want to develop yourself, then you're going to know what areas you comfortably can go and challenge yourself in uh, to get become mm. a better person uh, in the workplace and just, yeah, as a person. Yeah. So. yeah. So, so would you give a guideline that in the beginning of the work career you should try many things and then reflect that yeah. what fits you i think it's just in life in general like you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier about sports and how your father 
uh, introduce said I'm going to introduce to a lot of sports. So yeah, um, I think that's the way to go. I mean, otherwise, you're not going to get into contact with experiences. Uh, mm. If you just do the same thing every day, you know, uh, you're not going to get in exposed by other things that you didn't know existed. Mm. So. But obviously that doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone yeah. is that like that. They kind of want to be that comfortable and they, you know, I know I like this and I love this and I don't need to explore anything else. So yeah. fine. If you know that and you're comfortable with that, then do it. Mm. But I think that as a parent, I have twins, a boy and a girl who's six years old. Uh, we just want to expose them to as much of experience as early in their life as possible. Like Scouse oh. accent? Scouse accent, <laughs> <laughs> being one of them. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's pretty cool. Uh, the other day, I, uh, I, so I always play this kind of, uh, oh, my daughter, she has her um, kind of uh, cashier machine in her room as, as children do, you know, like to play uh, shop own, owner uh, yeah. role. Yeah. And she marks with these little uh, stickers and she puts the value, the, the price and, you know, kind of marks everything in her room. Yeah. And sometimes in my room and also in the bathroom and in the kitchen. But anyway, uh, so I come in there and I'm supposed to, you know, go around and pick some stuff and go to the cashier and yeah. pay for the stuff like you do in the shop. Yeah. And see this yeah. young six year old girl sits there and, and uh, kind of counts the items and yeah. then she's before uh, before I'm then gonna pay she says would you like would you love a bag love <laughs> love <laughs> love and I was like where did that come from I can't even imitate the, yeah. the accent love. but yeah. it was just so funny because it came so deep from the heart and so naturally and yeah. I was like she's turning into a scouse person oh yeah. no how how is it, Lawrence? In US, do you do you use the word love for people you don't know? Uh, no, not yeah, really, no. because I here here it's well, in the south. It's a little bit different. In the south, you have uh, which I'm where I'm a southerner. So in terms of even talking to people, it's so different than the north. The north, you, you can walk around the street, you won't say hi to anybody. Nobody's gonna care who they are there. In the south. Maybe they won't use the word, you know, love like that, but they're going to acknowledge you and they're going to want to know how you are. Is it then darling? Or sweetheart? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, kind of like that. Not uh, exactly like those two words. <laughs> yeah. I think it's yeah. the thought process of they're actually giving you the time of day. Yeah. So maybe they want to be saying like, you know, love or darling, but they're at least, you're in their mind now at the moment. Hmm. We're up north, They, you know, it's going to be... There, it's almost like a well, horse with blinders on. Nobody's gonna care. Yeah, yeah. Because here in Liverpool, they use the word love for like, you you go in the in the supermarket, the grocery store, yeah. and you, you buy something, and they they will look really bored, and they are not really like, even polite to you, but they will like, would you like to have a bag, love? And it's it, it's <laughs> it's just odd to me. <laughs> You love me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah, never I, met. It's I, like, I thought it was very strange when I came and and, uh, and and you know it would be different maybe if it would be an, uh, an older person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would have said that, but maybe a you know an eighteen-year-old girl at the shop telling saying me love. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, uh. hey, hey, hey! I know I look good, but I have a wife. But you know, I didn't understand first. You know. Why is she saying love? Is she yeah, flirting yeah. with me? Or yeah. then I realized, you, you know, just you know, two minutes later, that everybody says it. So yeah. Are you replying, love? Are you saying uh, no? No, that's okay, love. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I'm not that level yet, at least. <laughs> yeah. Did did well, this go I, a little bit off the track, or are we? No, still no, no it's, just getting the right stuff. Stuff. <laughs> it's exactly what this podcast should be. <laughs> <laughs> we we should have another one like about love and sweetheart yeah, yeah. thing. The scouse uh, accent. The yeah. scouse accent. Yeah. Actually, actually, if I still go back to craftsmanship, if you have nothing to add for this, uh, love, actually, love I, discussion. I really liked uh, what you were just talking about. Uh, you know, experiencing new things, getting like, uh, especially at an early age, how you kind of spread out, like how I was put into everything. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of like work, uh, I think it's really important for 
for a company uh, to like have an employee that's always working on one thing all the time why not like throw something new them their way that they're they're not you know comfortable with mm-hmm. that why not see what they're like because I know that it, in instances where we've had um, I know I'm not gonna say any names or anything but there was a person here that for years they were working on one project and then uh, they were told hey you're gonna try something that in their head they didn't believe that they that no that's what not that's not what that's for, not for me um, and I know here at the company they were like no this is what you're gonna do and then they excelled like big time with it mm-hmm. and now they're the head of this one department and for me when I hear that I'm like wow because in my head I'm like all right I'm only good at this or I could be good at this um, and then when I first came to Ryesoft it must have been the first three weeks I was here and they said hey have you ever written before and I said I've written like text messages <laughs> <laughs> and they're like no we want you to write a blog and I thought oh boy oh boy hmm. And, uh, and it wasn't like, hey, what do you think of this? This was, hey, you have one week. Write, write a blog and we're going to read it. And let's see what it looks like. Mm-hmm. And I, at first, I think if they would have given me guidelines, like, hey, you need to write a blog. It needs to be this, that. But they didn't. They, luckily, and for me, they just said, hey, you're going to write a blog. Uh, you can do however you want. Just don't, like, put curse words. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, done. And I wrote the most random thing but it ended up being they loved it and they're like keep writing it and then I really enjoyed writing it I'm not a very good writer but I like doing it yeah um, and then it became like the vlogs they're gonna put me on videos and stuff and I've never done that mm-hmm. uh, but it put me way out of my comfort zone <laughs> yeah yeah actually probably way Richard doesn't out. know but he's he's like their company is like the face he's in the films he's Army, in the vlogs no. he's in the <laughs> in everything even in the podcast well, he's he certainly has the voice for it so I just i must see this man yeah yeah i think it's also speech. helped me uh be more comfortable like approaching people yeah uh, which i didn't have a problem with before but doing like pitches i, I don't have a problem and it, i think it kind of opened me up also this ties in this is a big huge thing about it but even with being an athlete I was you know with an athlete you fail and then you fix it and then you try to be a winner in it and if you fail again you fix it so you're always like trying to get over that even with people when I'm in meetings you know and the criticism comes I I deal with it pretty well Mm -hmm. Uh, I can take it and I'm like okay all right you know and most of the time I just tell them right away like All right, thanks for the criticism. I'm going to use it or not. I tell them. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. Um, maybe they do. I don't care, really. But um, uh, but I, I don't know. I think it's really interesting that with uh, getting exposed to different things, and I think in the workplace, it's really good to an extent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that what you mentioned about taking criticism, that's, I think that that, that could should come very quickly in any kind of training whether it's uh, in academia or workplace or sports because I've just learned it in a in like an old age how important it is to not let criticism go into your personal core too mm. much obviously it'll sting a little bit you know always yeah. mm. but being able to like in acad- academia it's very clear you know you're gonna always gonna be criticized the, Your work is never going to be perfect, um, yeah. any all the papers you write, there's always going to be some weaknesses. So you're always going to get comments and uh, about those. But you know, maybe in the early career, you're like, oh, I'm such a terrible. You know, I don't know anything. You know, they're all criticizing me. All the whole document is read from all the comments. You know, yeah. but once you realize that you know, that it's like free tutoring people are telling me mm. what I can do better yeah yeah uh, it's just great I'll just write this down and use this and that I think that's also a little bit part of the mental toughness or resilience or what do you want to call it that when you are being personally criticized or evaluated about something learn how to take that as a as a, as a learning opportunity and not take mm. it like as, as there's some personally wrong with you as a person 
It's just yeah, that yeah. your skills need to be, uh, or you need to work on your skills. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes to be more active and not passive about it. Yeah, and and yeah, and just yeah, pa- like actively take in those things without just yeah. passively just letting them. Uh, how would I say? Lie around your soul and kind of yeah. paint your personal kind of identity in some way. Mm. Just you know, take it as a kind of external uh, part of your self as skills are. So um, I don't know. Mm, how no, no, that's interesting. Actually, I wanted to ask now, as you are doing doing a PhD, because I think it's it's quite a difficult position. Because usually, when you start doing a PhD, you are not competent on it because mm. scientific writing is such a niche skill that mm-hmm. you actually learn the scientific way of writing and actually doing the science only when you do it, and then. The criteria is anyway the same. It's already like international publications. So have, how have you felt this kind of that you need to start writing articles where you mm-hmm. usually don't really have the competence in the beginning of the study? So how would you describe mm, it? Talking about me or just in general or? Maybe both. Um, well, maybe I'm, I'm, I feel so old in this PhD studies. Everybody else is like 20 here in England. In Nordic countries, you're maybe 30 plus when you go to PhD, and it's a little bit different system here. So I, uh, uh, I've kind of done a lot of things before I started my PhD. I worked as a research assistant. I've coached professionally. I've published papers. So mm-hmm. for me, it's maybe more about. Um, a three-year vacation? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this this like, goes public, so no, you're supervised. No, this will years. cut this part. <laughs> no, it's it's for me. It's more about having the time to actually focus on, like we were talking earlier, one specific area. Mm. My research, you know, before I was always, you know, f- f- uh, doing this masters and this thesis, and then coaching all evenings, all weekends. So I was really busy all the time. Now mm-hmm. I just have a lot of time to focus on this area and that's probably been for me the biggest learning experience or 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 the challenge to kind of deal with is the time mm. that I have so much time to read and focus I'm like what to do with all this time and I end up being very inactive compared to when I was really busy mm. so that's been a really kind of revelation that I I am a very poor um, planner and a very unorganized person when I'm not when you don't put into a schedule. schedule. Yeah. All right. And that I think that's a little bit relatable to just an, being an athlete, an ex-athlete, where your life is so structured. Mm. You know, people tell what to tell you what to do. Your coach tells you, tells you to do this drill and show up at this time and then you have the equipment manager who tells you to put the stuff over there and then you have your whatever so it's your day is really structured mm, yeah. yeah and i think that many times when you quit sports you come into a void where you're like mm. so how do i do this uh yeah, yeah. no i don't know that's how when you that's when your wife steps in yes and says yeah or girlfriend says this is what you're gonna do and then they become your coach exactly and so do you want to a, go it took me a good <laughs> eight years you know, all by myself when I just finally got yeah. back to normal again. So yeah. now I have everything planned for me. All right. Yeah. That's really yeah. interesting. And, and this, is, this podcast is about also activity or especially yeah. about activity for the, for the employees or the, when you're working. So, so you work most of the time from home or how, how do you do? Like It's a little bit mixed. Uh, I like to get to the office, meet some people and but... I like my times at home as well, where I can just focus on uh, you know, being working in a very quiet environment. Mm. So it's a yeah. mix. Yeah, I think that's also, I don't know if it's in this podcast, but it's an interesting discussion. Which one is a better place actually to get things done if you can work home or in the office? Mm-hmm. I end up working most of the time home because I think I just get things done better. I can I can start right away from the morning. I eat breakfast and I just open my laptop and I'm all in there. You're in the office already. So yeah, can. I'm already in the office. And then also, like, if I want to, for example, I have a call or a Skype 
I can go for a walk and my neighborhood is quite silent so I can go there if I'm in the office I cannot go for a walk because it's really noisy in the center so I can kind of easier I can have better time being be more active there but I also have a gym downstairs so I can go just to do like five ten minutes when I start to feel that I'm not productive or I'm kind of stuck in in some some theme that I need to I need to solve so for me working home is actually I feel that it's more productive although if you every day home it would be maybe nicer to see people also like mm-hmm. just kind of as we are probably social yeah. beings <laughs> for for that reason you still have to say that probably <laughs> yeah yeah I, I don't know yeah <laughs> i've been working home so much <laughs> like are we social beings are we yeah i kind of like i well i i think if i didn't have i have three three young children that if if i'm home on it if i'm taking a home day I can get some stuff done, but at the same time, we're still kind of, at least what we're trying to do, we're trying to build off like, you know, use this like teamwork um, to solve the problem. So uh, for me, uh, being at work is probably the best, but there are some times where I'm like, man, I need to go on this phone call. I want to sit down and think about this. Mm-hmm. As long as the house is empty, yeah, I'm happy I could go there. Mm-hmm. But most of the time it's not. <laughs> I'm that kind of type of person that you know takes a lot. I had really a lot of issues with coming to John Morris with the hot desk system. Mm-hmm. So basically, what a hot desk system is that there's this bunch of tables and computers, and yeah. every morning they show up to work, you pick the available one. Mm-hmm. And I had really I struggled Ooh, with that. I wouldn't like that. No, because I, I like to have my you know my spot, my Zen zone. Where I can Your just space. in my space, you know. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it took me a while to get used to it. But now I just know the times where people, you know, PhD students, they don't come exactly eight o'clock t- to so, work. So, so you, you go earlier to get the desk you want? If I really want to work at a specific place, I, need, I just go early and take the... Yeah. And you have a favorite desk in in a room, even though the computers are the same, or, or how does it go? It actually it's quite funny. I thought I had a favorite computer, but then that one day I just somehow I just walked to another computer and sat down and started working. And then half an hour later, I realized why am I sitting at this computer? So then I started <laughs> using that computer. All right. So yeah, it's interesting, but you know, it it doesn't bother me as much now, but. In the beginning, it was a huge issue, so I stayed a lot home. I used every excuse to, you know, oh, it's it's a 40-minute mm. bus drive to the mm. office, you know, so I stayed at home. But then I got bored being at home, so and I didn't get stuff done. I started, you know, mm. I was going to say I started folding, folding, you know, laundry, but my wife is home and she's probably going to hear this, so she's <laughs> going to be shaking her head, no, you did not do that. That's a lie. <laughs> yeah. So I would have said she would not have been home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if yeah, she yeah. could hear us. No, but it's a lot of, you know, you can also have a lot of distractions at home. Uh, yeah, so. mm. true. But also for me, it's like, anyway, there's some things at home you need to do. So when, for example, I, I read the emails first, and then I need to think that how do I respond for some emails? I might yeah. wash the dishes mm-hmm. during that time. And then when I'm finished with that in five minutes, I know what I will write in the email. So mm-hmm. in a way, I get some things home done while actually mm-hmm. in my mind doing the work things. And it's kind of, I think I have found quite a good good rhythm for that. Again, you know, as long as you know yourself, you you know, aware of what you like and what you don't like, and and you know, if you have the chance to choose, then you'll just go what whatever works for you. Hmm. Yeah. Only, only if you get stuck on a problem, is there? Do you wish sometimes there would be like your your partner there, or like somebody there? Like, hey, this is someone I can like talk to. Do you miss that, or would you want that, or or do you find yourself calling somebody? Like, how how does that work? Mm. That's a good question. Like, or you just do it yourself and you're like, it's me or no, nothing. <laughs> yeah, sometimes my girlfriend is also working home. So actually we we kind of share the problems we have or, okay. or kind of the themes that I might say that I, I should decide what to do with this. And it always helps even if, if you just say it loud, you know, 
you make it in words and, and kind of you might figure it out by yourself so I, I think it helps yeah it's yeah I, I think it helps when when you have someone to that's actually a very good thing what you uh, good point that you make that I, I do feel that sometimes and I, I feel like almost like I'm panicking, you know, to write everything down and send emails around the world. Hey, I have this great idea, you know, what do you think about yeah, this? Yeah. And then, you know, five minutes later, I realized, like, ah, that wasn't that such a good <laughs> idea. Why did I send this email? <laughs> so it would have been different. It would have been just like, hey, what do you think about this? You know, mm. at the workplace with someone, it wouldn't be <laughs> recorded somewhere in emails. You know, what a stupid idea. You know, you could just yeah. kind of throw it around. So uh, I think that's that's uh, the positive thing about being in a workplace or surrounded with yeah. people that you work with on the same problem that you can kind of throw around ideas without uh, you know kind of let them loose into the air and somebody might catch it and have a counter idea mm. and I think that's how good ideas kind of come from uh, when you have that space yeah yeah and I think it's important for people to have I mean hopefully I mean most work culture I would say, I mean, I don't know the exact figures on this, so don't really take me at my word, but most, I think, the culture of it is that, you know, everyone could help uh, in different subjects. Like, if, if I don't know what to do with marketing, maybe I go ask somebody, like a programmer, that maybe, I don't know, maybe he has this weird idea that could work, mm -hmm. um, which we, ha we use that kind of at our, at like our coffee break or lunch. Hmm. I'll sometimes I'll just toss ideas to people that I that I know that are really uncomfortable with me tossing them <laughs> ideas <laughs> just to see what they do and, and a lot of times they at first they're like why I could see that in their head they're like processing why is he asking me mm -hmm. uh, but then all of a sudden they'll just come up with something that <laughs> it works and I'm like right, thanks you know and, and I think for them it makes them feel better um I mean, I'm not doing it to make them feel better, but I could see that they're like, all right, nice, you know, I helped a little. Mm -hmm. And I think that whole, the culture in that way is, it's becoming more of like a, a office that is more together, mm. more teamwork, I guess. Yeah, and actually... Maybe that's the athlete in me. Yeah, actually mm -hmm. what I miss is the, in Finland, it's always the coffee break that actually people go there and you meet the yeah. people. And now, as, as our company is kind of virtual organization, we we're not in the same physical location. So basically, you you miss those informal communications. So basically, yeah. you only say things that are important, or you think that are important in emails or in Skype when you have limited time. But there's quite a lot of things that you should be talking kind of casually, mm -hmm. and and I have noticed that many things are missing when you don't have this kind of coffee break culture. We tried to make a coffee break by a Skype, but mm -hmm. it didn't really take off yet. I, I think we need to take even give another chance of it or or a Friday yeah. beer together by a Skype. You can anyway you have, have a beer like on both a, ends. Like an open channel, you know, like we're having now between two countries. Mm. You just have that yeah, just yeah. running all the time. It's like, hey, well, what do you think about? So it was just like, or have like Skype filming all the time. Yeah, I, th I think mm -hmm. it could For work one actually, accident. especially if you have a big screen mm -hmm. and you kind of have it that you can actually just walk by it and, and say hi there. And it, it but then, actually, only, then, then you have to dress up for that day. You can't yeah. just be walking in your undies all day. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm dressed up here, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I have tried uh, FaceTime at Christmas time to be part of my family's dinner yeah mm. where they just had me propped up mm -hmm. yeah and then my sister said this is too weird so she just <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh. it's a bit strange uh we, i've tried it as well a couple of times with my friends uh, yeah. it's it's a little bit strange in the beginning and then you kind of feel uncomfortable so maybe after one hour, i think it was like maybe one hour two hours it's like ah that's enough See you later. Yeah. 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 yeah, have a nice one. Oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but all of this is really good because it's this active um, approach to basically what the podcast is covering, this active office. And, and like, not really, you know, I, of course, this is not like exercise or being active in the office, but 
just the active approach is exactly perfect to cover for this podcast. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm. It's, it's really interesting. Obviously. Yeah. So we've been actually going quite a bit and I think yeah. we start to get a little bit tired in our talking maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And Richard mentioned that you went to sleep five in the morning. How come? You know that sleep is important. <laughs> you, you, you're a specialist and you didn't sleep. What? <laughs> yeah. Why? We want Explain. Answers. Yeah. Well, I have some time man's going to do what a man's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's just, you know, some t- and very true. It's very important with sleep. I think that's one of the things I've been really working mo- personally on the last years. Um, yeah. I know it's just, I, I just had to finish a couple of things. I'm going to Iceland uh, to work as a psychologist for the under 20 uh, junior national team in, in nice. Iceland. Yeah. So I'm just gonna, it's going to be an interesting project. Uh, yeah. First time for me. So uh, as a psychologist. Uh, so yeah, I, I just tried to finish all the stuff that I have. And I got stuck in my data analysis uh, mind. So I just okay. realized it was like five o'clock in the morning. I was like, shit, I have to go, yeah. go to sleep. Mm. So Richard, this is the wrong answer, by the way. You always say my kids. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, it's such a long time since they've uh, uh, been waking up yeah, that I've forgotten yeah. about how it is to have kids waking up in, during the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was, or the wife. So, so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so I, I, I just need to ask, like, for the data analysis, was it the flow or the anxiety for get getting things done? Oh, it was actually was a really it? good flow last night. It was yeah, flow, yeah. yeah, with the SPSS uh, okay. Yeah, flow. it's just like because I don't know if anyone who's done SPSS or data analysis. So I just kind of do the cleaning of the data first, and then, yeah. then you know, there's you know, always a couple of variables that. You feel too lazy about recoding because it takes a little bit of time and then mm-hmm. but then you start kind of analyze analyzing and it looks like oh, i want to look at this relationship here and it'll ah oh, i need to recode this variable now so i can actually look mm-hmm. at this so then you start doing that an hour later you just like, okay finally i can look at this yeah oh no relationship oh damn it yeah. next one mm-hmm. and then you know before yeah. i realize yeah. it's five o'clock in the morning so. yeah Lawrence, you yeah. probably don't know the SPSS. It's it's anyway it's a uh, statistics software. Okay. And and it's 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 the thing is that when you click like analyze something, it gives yeah. like a printout which is like seven pages. Oh, and what you would like to have is just n- one number, and it gives like a PDF of seven pages. And then you scroll there, like, oh. where is the number? I want to know <laughs> why does it give yeah. these seven pages? And I'm always frustrated. Like, why do you give me seven pages? I need just like the the reply for the give me the is the meaning of life yeah, yeah. not the whole thing yeah but anyway so yeah so i i uh, went to bed very late it's not i don't usually go that late to sleep so yeah uh, maybe uh, i was very nervous about the podcast yeah. and i just maybe. i was avoiding really going nervous. to bed yeah yeah <laughs> and and do you actually know that when you're not sleeping well or enough you will be craving for the chunk food so do you feel yes. craving for the chunk food no, not at the moment, but I do know that uh, for me, it's more if I fall asleep, uh, like when I was younger, I, I used to uh, take a lot of naps. Mm. So I would go to school, I would come home, take a couple hours to nap and then go to practice. Mm. And I remember always waking up from th- those naps and I really wanted like a chocolate bar or something. So All right. You didn't remember to eat before, I guess. Yeah, probably, <laughs> you know, lunch and then you come home and then you fall asleep and then you yeah, it's a long time. I don't know, but you know, I, that's why I remember I craved chocolate after I uh, had a nap. Yeah. So, but yeah, sleep is very, um, I actually was very close to getting into the kind of the field of sleep science. I thought it was very interesting. I had very good teachers at Reykjavik University that had those uh, sleep uh, sleep courses. And um, it, it's, it's a, I've realized even now when I'm, getting a little bit older that how important sleep is mm, yeah i i normally sleep actually really really well but now for example i was this week in cardiff and the study is showing that the first night you sleep in the new place only half of your brain is sleeping well the other is like awake like if the lion comes mm. it, it didn't come but my brain was ready 
yeah, and then the yeah. second night you're kind of confident that probably the lion is not coming i guess <laughs> yeah. so so I, I feel it always when i don't sleep like the perfect night sleeps because i've used to quite sleep quite well yeah. i have zero issues sleeping <laughs> yeah yeah you you know when you don't zero. have when actually that's the people like many people say that i'm sleeping really well when i just go to bed i fall asleep right away but that's actually yeah. a sign of sleep deprivation so oh no so basically if you fall asleep always like right away it just yeah. shows that you haven't slept enough in overall so when you start to have some problems or it takes a little bit longer to fall asleep then you know that yeah. now you start to be about balanced of your sleep yeah, yeah. Most of the time I have to wait for my wife to fall asleep first <laughs> because I'll breathe on her face or something and she'll nudge me. That's the only, actually, yeah, <laughs> that's the only issue I have sleeping, getting nudged in the side. Um, All right, yeah. So should we wrap up or problem. do we have any other themes to discuss? No, I mean, if we have more, I think we should shelf it and hopefully if Richard's uh, up for it maybe coming back to another one yeah, yeah let's let's see yeah I'm I'm ready to roll anytime I think it's just fun I think this is a good experience for me just to um, you know have to sit here and have to I mean just you know being <laughs> you know you know just being this kind of uh, context you know I've never done it so it's it's a good I think it's a good experience so yeah we are also beginners so we yes we oh, you sound like this. pros yeah. guys yeah Lawrence yeah he's, he's the American yeah, Lawrence. Smooth, smooth guy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always the Americans we Finns come all, like, all, yeah. all it just sounds like a Finnish baseball player That's, yeah you know yeah. from from the east which, which is not the good thing no yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, so yeah but I think this has uh, been pretty good for sure we'll uh, definitely have Richard back I know that we had talked about maybe, or we, through the emails, we would talk about maybe work life and the balance. Yeah. Um, I think that would be a really good topic to cover. Yeah, yeah. We, we could maybe have it in Yeah, I guess we were kind of like all over yeah. the place. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I, this is what it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hu humans are, are not it. rational and organized. They are irrational and and they yeah. are like this. When yeah. The discussions go. Yeah. yeah. But but anyway, yeah. thanks Richard for for setting yeah, up the you. studio here in the in the Liverpool chilled wall <laughs> region. This is a nice studio on the sofa, and <laughs> thank you. It it was it was interesting discussions. It it was I learned also about what is important for work for me. It's it's more about seeing the whole picture and the mm -hmm. holistic, which was which was nice to understand. Well, thank you. It was uh, my pleasure to be here and and. Uh, also, uh, likewise, very interesting discussions, and I also learned something. Good. Yeah. Good. I've learned a lot. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, thank you for coming, and uh, Oli. Yep. We'll continue next time with Richard for sure. Uh, so stay tuned, and yeah, have a nice day. Yeah. You too. Bye.